There we go. Awesome. Welcome everyone to July 2021. I hope you're doing well. Um, I suspect a lot of people have taken off on vacation because we are free now after COVID. <laughs> and uh, I know that with school being out, a lot of people are traveling. So this is being recorded and uh, you all will have access to it afterwards. So SJREI is where the deals happen and you can ask me anything about real estate. As you know, we're here as education and encouragement we ask you to do your own due diligence before you go into any deals with any of the speakers, promoters, um, affiliates. You are responsible for your own due diligence. You guys hear me say it over and over. If you make money on a deal, I'll let you keep it. And if you lose money on a deal, I'll let you keep that too. All right, so our mission is to provide education, networking, and inspiration so that you can invest in your future and have profitable investments. We are where the deals happen. We're personally doing deals and most of the people who attend here are doing deals. Over 78% of our regular attendees are doing deals with each other. So we're gonna go into a market update. Liz, um, I'll have you present and just tell me when you're ready to go to the next slide. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Liz Puga, and I just wanted to let you know that I'm using the uh, quarter ending April uh, because CAR has not actually come out with the um, June report yet, so I don't think I've shared this one with you. And this is just a really condensed short version of it. If you'd like the full version, please let me know. Um, you can put your email in the chat box and I'll send the full version to you so you have all that info. But I'm gonna go through, um, just a portion of it for you. Okay. Okay, so um, basically, um, you know, as we know that, you know, we have COVID that we dealt with and we lost a lot of jobs, um, but we are, you know, recovering. And so there's been, you know, not fully, but, you know, there's recovery in the job industry. So that's good. But the interest rates are still really low. Um, I've even seen some input from the feds that they may possibly even go lower, um, but you know, it's just pretty crazy how low they are now. Um, okay, next slide. I think the average is like 3%. Wow. Okay, so the home sales are, you know, maintaining momentum. Um, so you can see um, let's see, cut off a little bit. In January, we were actually up a little. Um, so that's good. The, I mean, as we go through more slides, you'll see that um, there's some issues with the sales being that there's not much inventory, but um, what is on the market is selling So, And you can see here, we've had the strongest growth in prices in seven years. And again, that's possibly due to the low inventory and the low um, interest rates. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that uh, we have noticed is that people are not taking their homes off the market. So, you know, having cold feet or whatever, um, they're actually, you know, feel more secure in keeping their homes on the market. So they're not pulling them off. So that's a good thing. And then also with the equity, a lot of people still have skin in the game. So, um, you know, when they do sell, they're cashing out. So it's not like the prior, uh, you know, 2008 when nobody had equity in their homes. Um, now, the good thing is, is that people have homes, I mean, equity in their homes uh, when they sell. So they have options. So one thing here, you'll see um, the estimates on foreclosures. Um, if you look at the chart here on the right, basically bottom line, the people without any, um, you know, plan on what to do, uh, that is like 13% of the total foreclosures. 
So other people have options. Um, some people have equity, 20% have equity. Um, other people, you know, are doing modifications, like 7%, almost 8% are doing modifications. Um, and some people are doing, uh, you know, plans where they put the money in the back of the loan um, and just different options. But basically the percentage um, of people without any kind of plan are about 14%. Okay. So basically, like I said, there's non, um, the inventory is non-existent and you can see it's been the lowest in 15 years. And that's um, part of the problem that we have now. Also the affordability is deteriorating even with the low rates, um, just the new home starts, I mean, are you know, just not keeping up. Um, and you can see here in 2020 for California, we're at about 20, 27% uh, affordability rate. And in the Bay Area, it's even lower. That's California, so. So basically, um, you know, oops. <laughs> Uh, rates, and like I mentioned, could possibly even go lower, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, average 3% now, um, you know, just trying to feed the market more and keep it going and stimulate it may possibly even go lower. So again, the supply problem, um, supply and demand is a huge issue. Um, I mean, 30% of people who sold um, are leaving California um, and, you know, going out to other states or even other counties, um, you know, Central Valley, uh, other counties where it's much cheaper. So. so you can see here, the need for housing is more urgent now than ever. Um, again, I mean, you can see the migration here. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I mean, you know, you hear people moving out to Florida and Texas and Nashville and just all these other places because the prices, I mean, they're, again, they're cashing in on the equity and they're heading for the hills. <laughs> So um, you can see this is basically based on the new home starts, um, based on the permits. Um, based on the permits that are there now, we're still short. Uh, we need about, we're short about a, what, 180,000? Um, so there's still gonna be a supply issue uh, for a while unless we can you know, catch up with this demand. Okay, so yeah, this is regarding the housing affordability. Uh, California, this is a little gloomy, but it's the second worst job to construction ratio in the nation. <clears throat> the fifth lowest homeowner vacancy rate in the nation. The lowest rental vacancy rate in the nation. <clears throat> and 1.3 months of housing inventory supply in December. Um, and the median price was about 717. Um, and this again is for California. Bay Area is much higher, probably double that. Um, and the second worst state for the percentage of rent burdened households. Um, second worst state for overcrowded housing and dead last for supplemental poverty estimates. So affordability uh, will prevent many from achieving home ownership. Not too good. So optimistic, but not overconfident. Um, so you can see here, um, the housing market outlook. Let's see. Home sales are, have risen. Um, the change, you know, it's about 11% higher. Medium price is higher, percentage change. Uh, 8%. The issue is the affordability index at 
And then the the good thing is the interest rates are you know three percent. So that's that's the bright side of the picture. So the key takeaway here is the market is actually doing unseasonably well. There's still lots of demand. There's still lots of buyers because of the low interest rates. And the data closed above 2019 figures. <clears throat> the broader indicators are less rosy, still lots of folks in the unemployment rolls. There's a lot of people staying on unemployment um, instead of going back to work which is not a good thing. I mean, a lot of the restaurants and retail can't get people to go back to work because they're making as much or more on unemployment. Um, so yeah, COVID, I mean, is much better now with all the vaccinations available. And I mean, I've heard San Jose is like the highest level in the country at 85%. Um, we're, you know, that's really good for us anyways. Um, so, boy, let's see, keeping it real. Demographics create more, not less urgency and time to get serious about supply and new construction. I think that's one of the biggest factors there. Um, and then, yeah, so I don't know. Um, so I wanted to pull up some of the local stats here so you can see that this is not part of the, um, the state. This is local um, San Mateo County. Um, so you can see here in San Mateo, the medium price is 2.8 or 2.08. Um, home sales have increased 94%. Medium days on the market, eight. List to sales price or sales to list price is 108%. And the percentage of listings with reduced prices is 19.7. So um, the active listings, this is interesting here. Um, the percentage of change from last year is 41%. So there's 41% less um, active listings. And then we should have Santa Clara County also. Oh, Alameda. So this is Alameda. Um, the median price is 1.3. Um, home sales is up significantly, 130%. Uh, <clears throat> number of days on the market, eight. Sales to list price, 114%. And percentage of active listings with reduced prices is only 9.8. And again, here notice the percentage change um, from last year is 30, almost 31% less than last year. In Santa Clara County, pretty close. We have 33%. Um, less active listings than last year. Um, the medium sales price here has gone up 22, almost 23% to 1.67. Um, medium days on the market is seven and the uh, sales list price is 109%. And listings with reduced prices is uh, almost 14%. Um, and the, I mean, look at the uh, medium price. Uh, went up almost 23% to 1.67 million. So some interesting figures there. Um, you know, it's just the supply and demand issue. Luckily, we have the low interest rates, um, which don't seem to be helping a whole lot, but um, can't hurt, that's for sure. So again, if you want the whole report, the whole car report with all the data and everything, I can send that to you in your email. Um, just let me know. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. Uh -huh. Welcome. Awesome. So one of the things that we'll have to watch is what happened um, when everybody was freed from COVID between June 15th and the end of July, because historically July is a very slow month as far as closes and um, prices kind of revert back after the spring push. And then we see another little surge come August and September. So it'll be interesting to see what the numbers show this year, um, considering that people are free now to travel, whether it follows the same pattern or whether they've made the decision, oh, I can move now because uh, we're free. So we'll see what happens. Good. All right. 
So our upcoming events, you want to make sure and mark your calendar for a couple dates uh, next month. We are hosting Joe McCall, uh, one of my friends. He's an author, a podcaster. You may know of him. Uh, he's one of the, the few people out there that's like constantly coming out with um, value. He's giving you lots of information and he has mastered how to flip houses remotely. And so those of you who are thinking, okay, you know, the Bay Area is just too hard. Um, join us next month and learn how you can do it from your seat here somewhere else. I mean, that's what we've learned in COVID is, is how to, to work remotely. So Joe's going to share how we can even flip houses remotely. All right. Well, without much further ado, let's bring up the main speaker. Oh, wait, that's me. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> So those of you who don't know, I'm Lori Graymont. Um, I am a developer, a rehabber, flipper, wholesaler. Um, I work in real estate pretty much anywhere that I can add value. And I work with people where I can add value. So tonight, um, we're going to just kind of high level it for you on some of the local rehabs. Some of you may know I've been doing rehabs, wow, forever, um, many, many years. And during the 2008 to 2014 timeframe, I bought, sold um, well over a couple thousand properties nationwide, most of them in the Southeast, most of them in the Atlanta market, uh, rehabbed over 800 of those remotely and was really able to hone in um, processes, procedures, and systems. And so when I look at doing uh, rehabs, I like to do it in what I call a production format. And so I'm just going to share some things tonight. At the end, if you guys give me permission, I'm going to invite you to uh, a boot camp. And the boot camp will go into a lot more details. Believe me, what I'm sharing with you tonight is a value. It's going to be worth your time. But again, I'd like to share an opportunity for you to grow to the next level if you really are looking to do rehabs and flips. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I have it kind of broke out by three um, sections, purchase, renovate, sell. And I want to show you that during the purchase phase, a lot of the work can be done to reduce your risk when you actually buy it and can start the renovations. So we're going to spend a lot of time in purchase and then we'll move into the renovate and the um, sell, but don't worry, we'll get there. I'm going to start here first. So in the purchase side of it, one of the things I hear from a lot of my students and from a lot of you out in the SJREI world is there's just no houses for sale. I mean, we even heard from Liz what the inventory looks like. You know, what are we, 500, 600 houses that are on the MLS? You know, I hear things like, wow, everything's just flying off the shelf. You know, I'm having to pay over market to buy a property, you know, oh, having to pay more. I wanted to address this a little bit because the reality is there are deals out there, okay? And I don't want you to get frustrated because you can find them. So the first thing you have to do is step back and ask yourself, who's selling a house? Who might be available to sell a house? Well, anybody who has a property that has problems. Anybody that has people problems or Maybe a life phase change. You know, Liz had talked about over 30% of the people are moving out of the area. You know, a lot of them are retiring. They're cashing in on their house for their retirement. They're moving out. So that would be one target or demographic that is selling. Um, how about landlords? Right now, there may be landlords who haven't been able to collect rent, can't evict their tenants, and they're tired of paying for their tenant to live in their house by servicing the mortgage and maybe they're ready to sell. Or maybe it's somebody who has a red tag or 
um, a building code violation on their property and they just don't know how to deal with it. And so they're ready to sell. These are their target people that are actually selling. And most of these type of deals are not making it onto the MLS. So there are deals out there. When you go to buy a property, even one from these, you can kind of look at three different ways of buying them, three choices. The traditional market is, you know, maybe they've contacted a realtor or real estate agent or broker and they're getting ready to list it. But if you're there, maybe the broker doesn't feel comfortable listing it and they want to just sell it before they list it. So there is that, that method that you can go to. There's the wholesaler. And the wholesaler is the one who puts it under contract, but really doesn't want to close on it. And then there is buying it directly from the seller. And there's pros and cons to each one of these processes. Buying it traditional or on the MLS, you may pay market price. You may even have to pay over a list. But one of the things is if you're adding value, you're certain to get a deal because if you're paying more to get the deal, you're gonna get it. Um, but there's still opportunity to make money. Okay? Don't assume because it's on the MLS, you can't make money. You can. Buying from a wholesaler, I'll hear a lot of investors say, oh, I don't wanna pay a wholesaler. The truth of the matter is you're paying for certainty by buying from a wholesaler. You know, typically you'll pay anywhere from 50 to 100,000, maybe even more over what the wholesaler is paying. So let's just say, you know, the wholesaler has a house under contract for 1.2 and they're selling it to you for 1.3. So you're paying 100,000. But when you do that deal and you fix it and you flip it, you know, you can make 200,000, 300,000. Does it matter what the wholesaler made if you can still make profit at your number? No, it doesn't. So if the number works for you, buying from a wholesaler simply means that you're buying certainty. You're getting a deal to move forward. Now, a lot of the trainers in the industry talk about working with sellers directly. And that is definitely a way to do it. That's what we do at uh, Destiny Builders is we work directly with our sellers. Um, there's some not so good things. I mean, first of all, you have to invest money before you get results. So you really have to hope for results or you have to know the system to get results. You need to interact with sellers, a lot of sellers, before you get results. You need to be consistent, but if you have the processes, the systems, the procedures, and the consistency, all of that together will breed results. And the benefit of putting that together is that you do get a lower entry price of a property that you can add value to. So, you know, maybe instead of the 1.3 million, you're buying it for 1.2. So you already have 100,000 of built-in equity. Now, I wanted to share some numbers just so that you guys can get an idea of what's happening in our marketplace right now. Like, this is not two years ago. This is from February forward. So, I guess you guys know this, the punchline, six properties purchased. <laughs> All right. In our marketing efforts um, since February, we've invested 137000 and about another 45,000 in support staff. That has produced for us about 450 calls, phone calls from sellers. And out of those phone calls, 286 were good. That means the rest of them were take me off, you know, how'd you get my number, hang up. Oh, would you like to buy a car warranty? You know, all those fun things that, that you know, they get the number and they start calling. But 286 of them were people interested in possibly selling their house. And nobody really calls them and says, I want to sell it today. But a couple of them do. I think we had one of them say, I'm ready to dump it. So that was good. Yeah. <laughs> but most of them are just kind of like kicking the tire a little bit to see who we are and what we're about. 
Out of those 286, we got 56 appointments. Out of those 56 appointments, we were able to write 13 contracts. Out of those 13 contracts, we were able to buy six properties. So where that comes down to is, will those six properties provide enough income to cover the marketing, the costs, and the time? In our model, very much so. If you even just assume that we got 50,000 per property purchased, as far as value added, it definitely covers that, okay? This is something that each and every one of you can do. Or if you decide um, <clears throat> that this is something you're interest, interested in plugging into, this is what my students have access to. So like these 56 appointments, I allow my students, once they've made it through a certain point of training, to go out on these appointments and learn how to buy, basically on my dollar. And um, when we get a property, depending on how it's procured, that property may be something that the student learns how to rehab. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get my mouse to the click here. I apologize for technical difficulties. Okay. So let's talk about a deal. Who wants this deal? After repair value is 1.65, so 1,650. Purchase price is a million two fifty, and can I get a profit of 400,000? Sounds good, right? Who wants the deal? Who wants it? Well, it may not be a good deal. Let's talk about it. Okay. You're missing some key data. If we have a purchase price of 1.25 million, and let's assume the rehab is 100,000. Our acquisition and hold costs would be about 125,000 here in the Bay Area. So that brings it up to 1,475 for a CTF. And CTF is my acronym that I created. It's the cost to flip, right? So that's what it's going to cost me to get it to the point of a flip. So with those numbers, and these are pretty accurate to most of what we're working on there's still room to make money, okay? So if we take a look at that purchase price, or I'm sorry, that after repair value now with our cost to flip, there's 175,000 net profit. So one of the metrics that I use on whether to move forward on the deal is what is the, the return on that cost to flip? So if I get 175 divided by the 1,475,000, it's about 12%. So, and I'm gonna come back and give you some rules of thumb to use this, but this is just high level. And so what I'm doing here is I wanna to explain to you how I process the number of properties that we get. Um, 56 properties is quite a few properties and we can't buy them all, we'd like to, but we also have to be sure that we're buying it at the right price. So what I do is I start really broad. I start with estimates. And during the analyzing, I start like at the base of the mountain. And so I just use rough figures. If it's going to cost me 100,000, it's going to cost me, you know, a certain amount in closing costs. Is that going to get me close to the ROI that I want? Once I've gotten to that point, then I go to the next level of the mountain. So I'm going up in a little bit of a smaller circle, right? The base is bigger than the next phase and then the next phase. Each time I go around, I tweak it and I get more refined. And so that's the process that we go through. I don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis before I even put in a contract on the property. And I don't wanna spend 12 hours doing all the pieces that are required to have a detailed scope of work before I even know if I'm buying the property. So this is really important to just kind of take it in steps. 
So the steps are first you analyze it, then you buy it, then you rehab it. Each one of those steps gets better refined as far as what your costs are and what your profits will be. So step one, high level analyzing. These are the rules of thumb that I use. First of all, I assume every house that I'm rehabbing is 100,000. Will it be more? Maybe. Will it be less? Bonus for me, right? If it's, if it's less, that's money in my pocket. So why not use 100,000? If it's gonna be more, I'll figure that out pretty quickly, okay? Then I always do at least a 10% cost for acquisition, disposition, and hold. And that assumes a three month deal. If it's gonna be like a major add-on, these are not the rule of thumb. These are just for your simple fix and flip kind of deals that you know you make them look pretty, right? And I only say yes, like I only go to the next level if I can get at least a 10% return on my cost of flipping funds. I actually prefer to have that number be between 15 and 25, but sometimes I will go as low as 10% if I think that there's upward mobility as I refine my numbers. But if I'm at the, the big level, like the lowest portion of the mountain that we're going around and we're just like flinging numbers and it doesn't even pencil out at a 10% cost to flip to the ARV, I don't need to go any further because it's not gonna be a deal as I get more refined. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So in our process, we have an eight step buying process that each of my students goes through. The first thing when you're going out talking to sellers is you're gonna build rapport, you're gonna identify the pain, and then you're gonna walk the property. And this is where you get to refine your numbers a little bit more from that first step. The first step is analyze, decide if it's worth buying, you know, based on what we found out having a conversation with the seller over the phone. And it helps us kind of know what's there. This walk the property is the key to refining your numbers down to the next level. Okay. After we've walked the property, there's more steps and more processes. I'm not gonna be able to cover all of those tonight. We will talk more about those um, as we go through the workshop and then in the tra our coaching program, if you wanted to join the coaching program. We have money discussions. We prepare the expectations of the sellers. We find out what is their decision-making process? How do they decide things? Because a lot of times sellers think that they're making decisions that are logical, but really it's emotional. And so we kind of get that out and we talk about how to um, have prepared rebuttals that really help the seller to feel confident about moving forward. We present offers and then we solidify the decision. So as we talk about this refining the numbers, we're into the next step. This is like where we go and we walk the property and how we can refine our numbers. Okay, so we walk the property, we update our scope of work. Now scope of work is really what needs to be done to the house to bring it to the after repair value. One of the best ways to create a scope of work is look at what are the comps that you're looking at that you wanna sell? What does the after repair comps have? What is, you know, do they have a nice roof? Do they have a nice kitchen? Do they have a nice bathrooms? Um, do they have a beautiful outside yard? What is it that those properties have that your property doesn't and you can start to create the scope of work? In addition to that, you want to look at every inspection report that's on the property, add those items into your scope of work. And from there, once you have your scope of work, you can start working on a rehab budget. Once you have a rehab budget, and again, this is not going to be a detailed rehab budget. This is going to be lump sum budgets, and we have tools to offer you that. 
you come in with a number and you're ready to make an offer. When we make our offers, we don't just make one, we make three. If you think about it, um, I think it's really easy to explain with children, right? I have four of them. Many times I would say, do you want oatmeal for breakfast? And the first response is no, right? So if you talk to a seller, do you like my cash offer? What's the response gonna be? No. But if you go in and you say, do you like this offer or do you like this offer? Just like with kids, would you like toast or would you like oatmeal? Usually they'll say one or the other. And we do the same thing with our sellers. When we go in to make the offer, we offer multiple offers just to kind of see where they're at. And, and offers can always be renegotiated. So it, it's just a process that we go through. So when you're out with the seller and you're walking the property, these are the 12 things that you need to know about the property. These are gonna help you come up with the best rehab budget at this point in time. And it's also gonna prevent you from buying something that may not resell. So the questions are, how does the roof look? You don't have to be a general contractor to know if a roof looks like it needs to be replaced. Like if there's a tarp on it, it probably needs to be replaced. <laughs> um, you know, if it looks okay, maybe it looks old. You can even ask the seller, you know, when was the last time the roof was replaced? You can certainly tell what does the exterior look like? Um, Walking around, you can look at the foundation. Are there any cracks? You also should have reports. If you don't have reports during this process, you can get your reports. Now, as you're standing in the driveway, look up at the gutters. And what do you see? Do you see wood damage around the gutters? You know, is there, are there areas that you can see the sky when you're standing there? Um, these are all things to note. When you go in and you look at the kitchen, has it been updated? Has the plumbing been updated or the electrical? Like if you're in a house that was built maybe in the 60s or the 70s and you only see two prongs going in, like there's not that third one, probably you need to update the electrical. The furnace, again, as you're walking around, you can see, is it old? Is it new? What do the bathrooms look like? And then are there any foul orders? Is there a driveway, off street parking? Are there any neighborhood issues? Now, I'm gonna go to number 10 for a second here because um, <laughs> oh, a few years ago, I took some students into a house I was working on and um, we walked into the house. <laughs> And one of the students went, oh, my God, what's that smell? And I said, it's the smell of money. <laughs> but actually what it was was dog poo. Um, the owner allowed the dogs to use the entire house as their outdoor area. And uh, when I bought the house, the entire house was covered in dog feces. But like I said, that was the smell of money because I got it very cheap and uh, repairing it was not that hard after we got it all cleaned out. Um, we did have to seal the floors to get rid of the odor, but that one was the smell of money. <laughs> so, so I'm going to give you um, some rules of thumb as you're walking properties so that you can get an idea of how you can estimate how much a rehab is gonna be without having to have four or five contractors go out, which never show up and give you bids, which you have to keep calling to get. All right, so first of all, the roof. Typically a full roof replace is gonna be hmm, anywhere from like 5,000 to 50,000. I put 10,000 here because it's always good to overestimate the cost and have that go into your pocket. 
So if you're looking at the house and it's kind of a small house, go on the 10,000 side. If you're looking at a house and let's say it's 3,000 square feet and it's a shake roof, probably want to go to the 50,000. And here's why. Shake roofs that need to replace be replaced don't have plywood on them. So you have to put plywood on first and then put the shingles on. So you're gonna have more costs. And I don't know if you guys know this, but plywood and um, particle board, all that stuff is super expensive. Uh, about three weeks ago, I bought some plywood at $108 a sheet. So um, we just did a re-roof on a property in Saratoga, 3,000 square feet, our all-in costs for gutters, skylights, and the roof, all the underlayment, repair, termite, everything was 42,000. So that's kind of where the range goes. And you just, right now, again, this is still in the buying process. We're still in the buying process. So we don't need to go bring in GCs and get all these prices. We're just coming up with baselines so we know how to make our offer. And then once our offer is accepted, then we can refine to the next level, okay? So how does the exterior look? Depending on what you have to do, if you need to just paint it or um, you know, update some of the siding or do a full stucco, you're gonna be between five and 50,000. Are there cracks in the foundation? Okay, this is one that can get a little uh, tricky. So I bought a house in Berkeley that was in the Berkeley Hills. And this house was actually slipping down the hill, okay? That one I bought on purpose because I knew that it was scaring away a lot of other buyers. People don't wanna have to deal with foundations. In that particular case, I was able to take the, um, the house. I've done this in the Midwest, so I knew what we could do. We lifted the house up, we dug out, the hill was you know, going away. We were able to dig out so we could have nine foot ceilings in the basement, set the house back on the new foundation I created, and I just added 1,200 square feet to the house that can be air conditioned and add on to the house without having to go out, without having to go to the planning department. So there can be benefits to it. Now, that is not something I would recommend for anybody that is new to this process. Um, if we would have had an earthquake while the house was lifted up, I could have lost everything. So it's that was a risk. Um, but I'm just telling you that foundations are not necessarily something to be afraid of, but it is something to be wise about. So if you just see some, some cracks along the way, that's gonna be maybe 10,000 in repair. If it's sliding down a hill like in Berkeley, think about me, that's gonna be your 200,000, okay? Um, is there wood damage around the gutters? Termite damage, uh, if there's wood rot around the gutters, there's probably some wood rot up under the shingles and some of the barge. Um, rafters, different things. So I would estimate 10 to 20,000 in repairing the termite damage. What does the kitchen look like? Now, I have 30,000 to 100,000. And I know some of you are going to go, well, I can go down to KZ Cabinets and get a kitchen for 5,000 or 6,000. Yes, you can. But somebody has to install it. And then you've got flooring. And then you've got tile and you've got appliances. So, you know, if you figure 30,000 to 100,000 for all the parts of the kitchen, you'll be in good shape. Uh, plumbing, 12 to 20,000. Electrical, 12 to 40,000. Furnace, 10 to 15,000. Bathrooms, five to 20,000 each. And is there any foul order? Okay, so I told you my dog story um, and I told you that smelled like money, okay. I bought a house in uh, Willow Glen and 
when I walked into the house, I mean, it was a hoarder's house. And after we got all of her belongings cleaned out of the house, I walked in and my feet were getting bit up by um, fleas. And there was this really foul odor. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is it? Well, one of the guys that I was working with, actually somehow he tripped and he fell into one of the walls and put a big hole in the wall. And out of the wall came all of these bugs because inside the wall were cats. So that was a foul order. That is different than buying a house that has the smell of mold or mildew. Okay, so if there is a foul odor, I just want you to have a red flag. I want you to understand what it is you're getting into because that particular house with the fleas and the bugs coming out of the wall was gonna get knocked down anyway. So that was fine. You know, it was just, it was disgusting, but it was fine. The, the dog house, that was fine. It was disgusting. But a house that is, I would say, infested with mold is not only dangerous to you, your workers, but possibly your future people who are buying it from you. And that needs to be taken very seriously. So if you smell something like mildew or mold, get it inspected by a professional before you buy it or make sure in your buying process, you put in there that you want that inspected, okay? Um, another red flag, no garage or off street parking. Well, it seems like we're moving to or wanting to move to like a shared economy where people don't need cars. Um, people still like garages and they still like off street parking. Now, if there's a way that you can put either of those in, that's a value add for you. If there's not, that may not be a good property because you want to appeal when you sell, you wanna to appeal to the largest audience possible. And some people won't buy it because of those reasons. So now your audience went from the largest to the next smallest, okay? So pay attention to that because when a market turns, any deficit like that is gonna make it hard for the house to sell, okay? Neighborhood issues. This is a lot of different things. Is there something in the neighborhood that would make your house not sell quickly? When we are in hot markets, almost every house sells. But when a market turns, houses that have deficits don't sell fast. So are there power lines near or over the property? Is the property next to a highway? Is the property next to a neighbor who has chickens and pigs and everything else in their backyard? Is the house next to a vacant house? Is the house next to a burned down house? Those are all the things to take a look at when you are making the purchase because they will affect your resale. So I'm going to kind of take you through a little case study. You know, we just went through a bunch of ways to um, value this. So I'm going to take you through a case study of a particular property um, and just show you that you can get some of this just from pictures. You don't necessarily have to walk the property. It is way better if you walk the property, but just to give you an example. So looking at this house, we can see the roof is fairly decent. The outside looks okay, maybe some paint. Kitchen definitely needs a redo. Flooring needs a redo. This is looking up where the gutters are. You can see that there's a lot of water damage. Okay, we're gonna have some work over near the roof. This is one of the bathrooms, pretty typical mold, but this is bathroom mold, not ceiling mold. So it's a little bit different. They're definitely gonna have to redo bathrooms. So let's just assume 
that we have this property it was built in 1967. It's 2,700 square feet. And remember I said, always assume it's a $100,000 rehab. Now we're gonna take those 12 items and walk through and add to this 100,000 rehab to get a better rehab price. So the roof looks good. The exterior of the house does need some work. There's gutter damage on the wood, so that's termite. New kitchen, plumbing probably needs to be updated. Electrical looked fine. The furnace does need to be updated. Bathroom needs to be updated. No foul odors. Yes, there is parking off the street and there's no neighborhood issue. So if we add up all these additional pieces here, we will see that our 100,000 plus our 78 that we just did is a rehab of 178,000. Okay. And maybe on our first round, we thought, you know, we originally thought it was gonna be 175, now we're at 178. So we've just refined our process and there's no red flags. Red flags are key. If there's a couple of red flags, probably it's not worth a deal. So we're doing all this before the offer is accepted, but once the offer is accepted, we get to roll up our sleeves and dig in. This is where we get really detailed. Okay, this is where we can bring in our contractors. And the reason is because when we put our offers out there, we actually have a contingency period that allows us the time to do the research. Probably, I was gonna say maybe four years ago, five years ago, um, I would get a call probably every week um, from wholesalers. And, and now that we do our own marketing, I don't hear as much from wholesalers. Actually, I give them stuff to wholesale. <laughs> But I would get these calls from wholesalers and, oh man, I have this deal, like I have this deal in Concord, or I have this deal in Berkeley, I have this deal in San Jose. And one of the first thing I would, would ask them is, do you have it in contract? And they'd be like, uh, no. And I'd say, okay, call me back when you do. Well, I don't know what to offer. And I'd say, do your best. But part of that is that you don't want to go through all this effort. You don't want to drive and walk a property and spend all your time if you don't have control of it, especially in this market. So you have to balance how much time you put into getting the property and then refining your offer. So everything that I've talked to up to this point was even before it's in contract. Now we're going to talk about when you have it in contract, these are the steps you go through. Good? Okay. So refine your rehab scope of work, refine your budget, and then decide if it's go or no go. If, you know, you can invest the time you need to in the pre-rehab planning, and then if needed, you can go back and renegotiate the deal. You know, and I always tell my students, you know, we want to make our best offer going in, but that doesn't mean it's our final offer. That was the best offer we could make with the knowledge that we have. And we may have to renegotiate. And, you know, quite honestly, I think a lot of sellers expect that if you set it up the right way. Okay. So creating the scope of work and budget. When you go back out to the property, you wanna make sure that you take copious pictures. With our phones now, it doesn't cost, it's not like you have to take the film in and get it developed. You know, you can take pictures and delete out what you don't, but take copious pictures. I say at least four pictures per room, um, four pictures, you know, of each side of the house, the backyards, everything, because these pictures are gonna help you when you create your budget. Okay. Review every inspection report. 
So if there isn't reports, you need to order reports. Roof, house or home inspection, and termite. Those are the minimums. Then you may want foundation and you may want mold or um, mildew. All of the things that are called out in the inspection report that would scare a new buyer, that's gonna go into your scope of work and your budget. You know, things like a light switch being turned upside down. Okay, that doesn't matter. But if you've got, um, let's say one of the blocks under the house is missing part of the foundation, yeah, that's going to scare somebody. You want to fix that. So you're going to get all of that in. And this is really key. And I know that not everybody um, does this, but this has helped me so many times on my projects. Measure and draw a floor plan. Now, a lot of people say, well, can't you just get one from the county? Well, most of the stuff that I buy is like, pre-county, like I'd have to go down and look at the microfiche and it's just as easy for me to draw the plan. So I go out and I get the little, you know, grid paper and one grid equals one foot and I just draw it. And then I mark where every window is, where every door is, um, where the toilets are. So I know exactly what I have because if I'm replacing windows, now I know how many windows and I know the sizes of my windows. If I'm going to replace my doors, like bedroom doors, I have all my bedroom door sizes. So it's basically taking an inventory of everything in the house, putting it on a piece of paper, and then that is your guide. From there, you can create a detailed budget. And I have a spreadsheet that I keep um, with all of my budget amounts on, you know, like what's it gonna cost to replace, you know, a chimney or that kind of thing. And as I get new numbers, I update it. But you can get your detailed budget um, kind of by calling around, like you don't even have to have a contractor bid things because it's really hard to get contractors to bid. So you create your detailed budget, just call around and talk to people. Hey, what's it gonna cost if you were to do this? And what would it cost if you're gonna do that? Or even join some groups on Facebook. I see a lot of stuff going on. I've got a um, couple of Facebook groups where people are throwing out, hey, I just did, um fencing redwood eight foot a linear foot okay you know so those numbers are out there and then a detailed scope of work the way i like to do my scope of work is i like to write it out be very clear and if you're moving walls having that floor plan drawn as is then you draw another floor plan as proposed and if you need permits then you've got that drawn for your permits you're ready to go. The last thing is a Gantt chart. And a Gantt chart pretty much is like a visual of when everything needs to start, when it needs to end so that you're ready for the next guy to start. Project start to project end. It's beautiful. So this is how I take my rehabs into production. Now, I do it a little different. I mean, most people, when I say average time to flip, they end up spending about six months. And part of the reason is that they walk the property with a GC or a couple GCs, and they say, this is what I wanna do. They don't have any of the documents we just talked about. One GC creates a bid and says, oh yeah, it's gonna cost you 125,000. Another one creates a bid, 145,000. Nobody puts timelines on it. They are not apple to apple. And all of a sudden you're moving forward with a GC. And as you know, most GCs like to get like 25% down. And then when they get to 50% done, you give them more money and they get to 75% done, you give them more money. But did you know that the GC is not working just your job, right? They have you 
and this guy and this guy and this guy. And so they might be in your job for three days and then disappear for a week or two and then come back and then disappear for a week or two. Or they might tell you, oh yeah, the plumber, he's backed up. I'm not gonna be able to get to the plumbing until some date. You don't wanna do that. You wanna work with people who will come to your job and get it done. So I just wanna share a little bit about what we've done. Um, this is a house that uh, a wholesaler called me about. And so I was able to buy this from a wholesaler. My purchase price was 2 million. And the great thing about this is the seller was willing to carry. So I didn't have to come up with a 2 million. They were waiting until I sold it to get their 2 million. So this is what it looked like on the inside. Um, I don't think the floor had ever been washed. Uh, this is the stairs. And this one did have an odor. It wasn't dog poo, it was rat poo. The backyard <clears throat> and the kitchen. I don't know if these videos work here. Yeah. The nice avocado colors, right? So this is a picture during our renovation. We ripped everything out. We put in new windows. This is what the backyard looked like. <clears throat> and this is a video that my team put together of the process. Um, Okay, so that was not six months. That was eight weeks, start to finish. And that particular rehab was a $300,000 rehab in case you're wondering. Yes, that was a big rehab. So everything that we talked about up to this point is actually in the purchase process. Before you even own the house, you can go through all that, you can get it all set up. And once you buy the house, it's time to hit the ground running. So we have eight steps that we use. We set up the job. We create the detailed scope of work that's actually done during the purchase. Um, we hire our contractors during the purchase. And then once we close, we have our project kickoff. While you're managing the project, you need to be on site every other day, if not every third day, but don't go any more than three days. And you need to be having like a binder on the site that has the Gantt chart and be tracking, are you on time? What's the budget? Um, and don't ever make a decision for a change order without checking your budget. Just some things here. Then you prepare your punch out, you get ready for sale. Um, you, you make sure that you're gonna maximize your profit. And then once you're done, review everything what worked, what didn't work, revise and go out there again because every project is different and it's an opportunity to learn to be better at the next one. So we have 50 steps to a rehab and I call it rehab production 
because it really is like production. Of the 50 steps, you're not gonna do all of them on every house, but you are gonna go in this order. You're gonna have your pre-construction, you're gonna have your rough, you're gonna have your major systems, your unfinished surfaces, your finished surfaces, and then your final details. All of that way, and then some of these are dependent on others, some of them can be done simultaneously. And that's how you can get a rehab done in eight weeks by managing all these pieces. If there's no dependency, it should be done right away. You know, if you have to wait, like you have to have all the plumbing and electrical in before you can hang the sheetrock. Okay, get that. But you could be doing the backyard before anybody's doing any plumbing or electrical. So you can get things moving ahead of time. A key piece to success is having the right team and the right structure with your team. So I personally create my budget and I give it to the contractor and say, can you do it for this? Can you do it on this timeline? Can you do it for this price? I don't ask them to give me a bid. That way I'm getting apples for apples. And I might give it to two contractors. I mean, when I was doing remotely, I'd give it to three contractors and say, come back and tell me if you can do it for that price. Um, and then I would tell them, you know, if there's gonna be a change order and you didn't notice it in the beginning, I'm not paying for it. If it's something that I change as a change order, I'll pay for it. And a lot of times um, they would come back and adjust the budget just a little bit more, but not too much and we have a very smooth process. When you give them the budget and it's by line item, like one thing that they can finish, let's say paint the interior of the house, paint the exterior of the house, install gutters, install the roof. When it's line item, like by line item like that, you can pay them by line item. One thing that people really like is a paycheck on Friday. Okay, so you pay your contractor weekly for anything that's done 100%. Now, let's say that um, I told them that I would pay him 10,000 for the roof and the roof is done. Well, I'm not gonna give them all 10,000. I might give them 9,000 or I might give them 8,500. And the other 1500 is gonna set aside in a hold back account for them. That hold back account ensures that they come and they do the punch out, right? How many times have you worked with a contractor and they got the job like 90% done, but they didn't do all the little details that take time and they never came back? Well, this way they come back because they want that extra money, that hold back. And this is a process that you have to explain to contractors because they've got it in their mind that they get 25% and then 25 and 25, but that's not gonna protect you because how do you know that the deal or that your rehab is 50% done or 75% done? You don't, but you know if a roof is 100% done, you know if the painting is 100% done. So it makes it easy. Nobody is discussing whether it's done or not done. I always offer a bonus if they finish early. Uh, it becomes a little bit less of a bonus if they finish on time. And then it becomes a penalty if they are late past 10 days and then it gets very severe if it's past 15 days. So that's one way to encourage that they stay on the schedule. Then the other piece is I try to create a team feeling like it's not them against me, right? We are a team. So I always have a kickoff meeting and then we have a wrap up party and you know, grills, they work well. So here is another project that we did. Um, purchase price was 1.287 and ARV is 1.7. Let's see if we can get this to play. That's the, the rehabbed one. This is what it looked like originally, the backyard. Okay. 
This is the kitchen. It was very small, like you come in from the garage right into this little kitchen and there was a wall that separated the living room, the kitchen and the dining room. So here you can see we did some work. Um, the wall actually got taken out and a beam got put in. All of the um, bathrooms had significant dry rot and floors, so we had to put in brand new floors. So this is a picture of the, the lamb beam that went in to open up that room. And that's actually standing in the kitchen looking into the living room now that it's been opened up. This is what the living room looks like before and now. And this was the new kitchen. Okay, put it in the chat box. How many weeks do you think that rehab took? This is time for interaction, chat box. How many weeks? 10 weeks, 12 weeks, four weeks, eight weeks. How many weeks did it take us? <laughs> you guys ready? Four weeks. <laughs> that was four weeks. And uh, that was a hundred and twenty thousand dollar budget. So yeah. And there was a bonus for the guys, believe me. Yeah. So I'm gonna wrap up here um, in the next few minutes. I just want to move into the next phase and talk about some things that are key in order to have a quick sale. First of all, buying right is important for quick sale. We talked about the red flags and um, any house that's got deficits like power lines and that, they may not sell as fast. So there's a rule that I call the 8-8 rule. And what that is, is that the average buyer stands about eight minutes at the front door and will look at everything that's within eight feet of that front door. And so everything that can be seen in that eight feet should be perfect. Anything that is sloppy or dirty, well, it might not be that big a deal if you lived there. When you're trying to sell, it sets in a, a feeling that maybe something isn't done nicely in the house. And it's kind of a subconscious thing. You might not even notice it right away, but then you go, yeah just not quite feeling it, okay? The next thing is details count. If you walk in the house and, you know, the there's paint on the floor or the cleaning wasn't done well, again, it sends a subconscious signal that there's poor workmanship. And so you're not gonna get top dollar. You definitely need to stage the home and have professional pictures done. A lot of times your agents will do that for you, but if not, invest the money. Um, staging is 5,000, maybe 10,000, depending on how big and how many rooms and how long. Uh, it's so worth it. And a lot of the staging companies will have professional pictures where they touch them and they make it look wow. And you want that wow when people look at it. And kitchens and bathrooms sell, you know, do them right. 
I see so many times people will just paint cabinets or paint over bathrooms. And the reality is the house will sell, but you probably are leaving money on the table by not putting in new kitchens or new bathrooms. People really like to have it move in ready. They don't want to be doing anything, but they also want to be able to um, show off their house to other people. And so the kitchens and the bathrooms sell. So I've mentioned a couple times that we are having a boot camp. Um, Jeff, you've got the dates, right? Uh, yes, August 6th and 7th. So that's uh, Friday and Saturday. August 6th and 7th. In this boot camp, I only have room for 12 people because we're renting a big van and we're going to be going around. So what I'm going to cover in this is like how to find contractors, how to hire contractors, making sure that you don't get cheated, and how to get contractors to basically rehab on production so that um, you can get your projects done in eight weeks or four weeks instead of six months. We're going to talk about sizzle features, things to install on every rehab, um, colors, how to create a palette or a design board that you could take from house to house and not have to rework every house. You know, we'll go through the 50 steps in the right order of how to do everything in the house so that you don't have um, different subcontractors stepping on top of each other or making a mess on the floor when they're painting, things like that. We'll talk about the five things to do before listing any house to ensure that it actually sells. And we're going to, yeah, the 50 step checklist, um, how to handle uh, violations, um, citations. Let's say that you're moving forward on a rehab and you didn't know you needed a permit and you get a stop work order, what to do with that. Or if you've got a house that you bought that has a red tag on it, or if you run into any mold, how you can uh, make sure that you're safe with that. We're going to talk about the common mistakes and um, that a lot of investors do, the thinking that needs to be changed, the deals that should be stay, you should stay away from. You know, you don't want to end your career before it starts. And uh, you'll get to talk to some of my contractors. We're actually doing the training inside one of my rehabs, so I can kind of take you around, show you. And then um, I'm gonna take you where I get some of my products so that you can learn that. I'll tell you the information about the vaccine of buying uh, from these wholesale places and what you need to understand when you're working with contractors. And it's just like a, an opportunity to not only um, learn, but network with people who are doing it to see some of our deals and, you know, it's kind of like us opening our kimono for you guys to see what we're doing and see if you want to be a part of our team. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we are getting plenty of leads and our students are going out, they're learning how to buy, they're, they're learning how to rehab. And so if that's something that you're looking to do, we do have that opportunity for you too. But this particular training, um, I did it in 2019. And it was uh, $49.97. I'm doing a COVID special. It's just this time, this training only, that I'm dropping it down to $29.97. Um, I'm limiting it to 12 people only. And so I would say go out and sign up before it fills up. All right. So I'm going to open it for questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. And Jeff, you're up. I, I've, I've got a couple here. All uh, right. C, CB. Oh, no, Lou, Lou had one. So uh, this was uh, people are buying properties with no inspection contingencies. So it would be a put you at a big disadvantage to get all the inspection reports. What do you think about that? So buying or selling so if i'm buying from a seller without it being on the mls 
I have what, what, what we've been getting, what, 20 days, 25 days inspection contingencies, right? <laughs> Whatever we can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that gives me plenty of time to get my inspection reports buying directly from sellers. If you're buying off the MLS, um, typically they already have inspection reports. And so you can make your decisions on that. Um, if you're buying from a wholesaler, again, ask for inspection reports. So it really just depends where you're getting it from. But, you know, if you're not getting inspection reports, don't go non-contingent. I mean, that, that's that's going to end your career fast. Yeah. Uh, I've got one here uh, regarding your, your bonus structure. Do you give your contractors a bonus for being on time or early? Uh, like finishing the project on time or early, yes. Okay. I don't track hours or days that they're there, but I give them the Gantt chart and say, okay, this is when it's supposed to be done. And as long as I don't change the scope of work, and that's a big if, because sometimes I do change the scope of work as we're doing it. Um, yeah, so then that would change. I've got one from Lou here. Do you have a favorite uh, paint colors and how many colors and and he, and Lou said it's kind of tough. So I, you know, yes, you you have a. I I notice you do. I notice you have a certain palette, but yes, maybe to yeah. So what I do is I create a design board that has um, pretty much the same colors. So the same interior paint colors, the same exterior paint colors, um, tiles even if I can't get the exact tiles, similar tiles, because then um, I don't have to really work that hard to come up with what looks good together. And as far as the paint goes, I can take it from one project to the next project to the next project, because you see, sometimes you buy more than you need or you need just that little bit more. And so we're not wasting anything that way. And our tile too, we take our tile from one project to the next. And that way we're not having to go stand in line to do returns or um, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, um, as far as colors, I use Sharon William colors. My interior whites, like some of my projects I'll do with a, um, it's called worldly gray. And then uh, that's the walls. And then my white would be, uh, now I'm drawing a blank. I just had it. <laughs> know something I'll, I'll it'll come to me again but um i've switched from the worldly gray to pretty much painting all of my uh interiors white and my doors are black and then i can use either gold finishes or i can use brush nickel finishes or i can use chrome finishes depending on what the feel of the house is so other questions do you have a, an, an interior decorator that? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. I'm going to try and, here we go, stop the share. You, there we okay. go. No, I do all of my interior designing. Um, you certainly can have an interior decorator. I did that when I was working on a project in Las Vegas. I asked an uh, interior decorator to walk the property. Um, told her the kind of vibe I was looking for and had her create was what I refer to as a design board. And the design board, you know, showed colors for the walls, the, the trim, the uh, fixtures, what type of lights, those kind of things, the carpet, the flooring, all that kind of stuff on the design board. And then you can just take that and go find the right things that match that. Do we have any more questions? Oh, the, the white paint is called Snowbound. I knew I would come up with it Snowbound. eventually. Yeah, so I paint my walls in a flat, um, all the walls in a flat, even the bathroom and the kitchen. But in the bathroom and kitchen, I add a, a mildew resistant uh, additive. So I actually add it to all the paint. And so it goes for all the rooms. We use the LBT 
which is like the vinyl flooring that's planks that snaps in that can go through every room. So you're not having to change from, you know, uh, engineer to tile or have any transitions. Um, so we put that in all the, the rooms and then our doors, we paint those um, with a, a black from, from Sherman Williams, but we do that in a high gloss black and they look really sharp. You know, Lloyd, I, I'm, I'm gonna cheat a little bit because I, I know how many projects we have going on. And I noticed on, on the second day of this workshop in August, August 6th and 7th, so there's the, uh, a bus tour. There's a, yes. So how, how many, can you talk a little bit about how many of those projects you're gonna see on that bus tour? Because that's, that's a big deal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so let's clarify. Bus tour <clears throat> is like not a big, you know, big, big party bus, but it's going to be a smaller bus. And um, we will hopefully see four of the projects, oh, yeah. uh, but I can't guarantee that. I, I can say at least two. And um, we will definitely go to four of the stores that I normally go to. I kind of make an introduction so that you can go in later if you want to buy your products there. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And we go out to lunch and, you know. It sounds like fun, right? It is fun. Uh, you get to meet my contractors. They'll be at the job site so that you can ask them questions. And But you can't take them. Sorry. <laughs> They're loyal. <laughs> Uh, there, there's a question about another date for the boot camp. But it's just, how, how, what's your, no, this is going to be it. Okay. Yeah, I only do it once a year. I only do it once a year. And um, yeah. I, I know some of the students that you have are talking about being at the workshop. Do you, do you plan on having the students there? Because I was talking to Ray earlier today. Oh, I yes. Ray's on here. But. Yes, for sure. Oh, so my bonus, like what I offer them. Um, so I kind of do it. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but what I do is I calculate what my cost to hold the property is per day. And so let's say my cost to hold the property is $635 a day. So if they finish early from the when I said, then they finish four days early, they'd get that times four. And then the penalty. Um, is that same because I figure if I'm going to penalize them, I should also offer that same opportunity. And I always give 10 days for them to pull it together. And then it's after that 10th day, then I would charge the same in penalty as I do offer in bonus. Other questions? Uh, do, do you skip using uh, Home Depot? Home Depot for buying products? No, I, I use, okay. I use Home Depot and I use HD Supply, but I also use um, a lot of the wholesale places that you can go to. And I personally, um, when I'm getting ready to start a job, I personally like a Home Depot because I can send them my purchase uh, list. Like I can say, all right, you know, I'm gonna need this many two by fours, this much sheetrock, this much insul insulation. So like my first phase, I can get all that dropped at the site. And um, if I buy enough of the stuff that uh, I need, they can send it to something called the bid room. And the bid room is like, I don't know, this, secret room <laughs> that's for pro contractors where they take a look at what you're buying if it's over I think $2,500 and they'll see if they can offer you any discount on it. So for example, um, I don't normally buy my cabinets through Home Depot, but this particular time I did buy my cabinets through Home Depot, the original price on the cabinets was about $8,000. And when it came back from the bid room, they had knocked it down to $4,500. Hmm. Yeah. 
Um, I've tried it on appliances. I have not seen uh, any success in getting reduction on appliances, but definitely on lighting and electrical and um, things like that. So I always try that. But when it comes to my tile and it comes to um, my granites and a lot of my uh, cabinets, I like to go to the wholesalers. I say granite, but I actually use quartz. So anyway. So Lori, uh, on the description of the page, so your contractors, both both the, the both the teams, they're going to be on the sites for that Friday and Saturday, August six and seven. Well, not on Saturday. They'll be there. Um, they'll be there on Friday for the social. We're going to be doing a social hour with drinks, cocktails. Uh, they're going to come. Friday's payday, so they're coming. <laughs> they'll be there. <laughs> so they'll be there. Sure. And then um, Saturday is when we're going to be doing the bus tour and seeing the properties. And so you might see them at one of the properties working, but yeah. So everyone that joins the, the book, they should wear their work clothes. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, when you, yeah, this is not come in business casual. This has come with, you know, closed toe shoes and jeans and yes, exactly. <laughs> Someone's yeah. got a question here. Why are you buying materials and supplies rather than having the contractor buy them? That's a great point. Come to the boot camp to find out. <laughs> there you go. I think it's listed here. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you got to think about how does everybody make money in the game? Okay. And if you've ever worked with a contractor, you know that, um, Maybe their material price says 2,500, but then they add on another 10%. So like they're marking the materials up and they, they say that they're doing that for their, um, their handling costs, right? For, for them having to do that. So if I have, you know, I think we have what, seven, nine projects right now going. Um, if I have nine projects and I have nine different, well, I have three different contractors, adding all those extra 10%, why don't I just take those 10% off from them and hire a person called a construction coordinator? And that construction coordinator keeps track of all my supplies and I'm paying wholesale price instead of retail plus their admin fee. So that's why I buy my materials. And a lot of times too, um, I will act as the, my owner builder. Now, this is not suggested for everybody. And if you're not experienced, you need a contractor. But if you think about it, a contractor will hire a sub, sub being somebody that's like framing, electrical, plumbing, you know, tile. So those people, and those are companies and those companies hire the labor that come to your house and do the work. So you have one, two people before you get to the labor. Well, you really wanna to get to the cost of things, just hire the labor. You have to be willing to manage it. That's why you need to be going on site, but you're gonna go on site anyway. So you can get around a lot of the costs that add in. I mean, just to give you an example, um, <laughs> This last week, I received a bid of $26,000 to redo a driveway, which, you know, it's a pretty decent price if I was a retail customer. But by me buying the concrete and hiring the guys and taking the risk of it, I'm able to get it in for $12,500. Okay, that goes to my bottom line. So those are the kind of things that we talk about. There is risk. You have to understand, you know, I'm not saying go out there and be me. I'm just giving you ideas of how you can do it. Okay. So, uh, Lori, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the description. Yes. So, you know, I, when I'm hearing a lot on the calls and the other, that's where I come, I hear the calls and like, so will, will you go over some of the, uh, unique zoning issues and and county you will you go over that in the uh, the workshop 
So I don't go over any of the zoning. I will go over when a permit is needed and when a permit is not needed. Um, I'll talk about, you know, how to pull your permit. Sometimes, depending on the authority that's overseeing, you want to pull your permit in series, meaning you pull one, get that going to, before you pull your next. Um, we'll talk about how you can add on to houses uh, and make it a simpler process because most of the time when you add on to houses, you need to go to planning and permitting, which you know, makes the timeline long. So there are ways that you can add on to houses without having to do that. You can get over the counter approvals or expedited approvals. And we'll talk about those for sure. How about uh, ADUs? Uh, um, so in 2019, I didn't really talk about ADUs. I've done extensive research on it. So we will touch on it. Um, it's a little bit early in the process, in my opinion, to add on ADUs, and we'll talk about why. But to get additional units, uh, definitely worthwhile. Now, when I say ADUs, like you've got a house and you're going to add an ADU and then you're going to resell it. Um, where I think ADUs make the most sense and it's what we're looking at doing in Nevada is when you've got income property. So you've got, you know, two houses and you can add up to two more. For sure, you want to do that on income properties, but not necessarily yet on the flip properties. And we'll talk about why. Yeah, for sure. Other questions? I don't have any other questions from the, the group, Lori. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully you guys found value. Did you find value? Good. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thank you. We will see you in August. Enjoy. Be safe. And until we meet again.